Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. All right, folks, welcome to another great episode of We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only place where you come to learn how to take apartment buildings and turn them into amazing communities. I have here a repeat guest by popular demand, Lane Kaoka. So how you doing, buddy? Good. It's been a while. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for likewise. having me, John. Aloha, everybody again. Yeah, great, great to see you, man. So hey, let me introduce you really quick. For those that don't know you, I know you you have, this is, uh, you know, the second time on our show. We appreciate you having, me, having you back. Uh, first show was great. And so uh, this is going to be another good one. So Lane currently owns about 4,500 units across the United States. He lives in Hawaii and uh, recently quit his job as a professional engineer with a MS in civil engineering and construction management and a BS in, indust in industrial engineering. So Lane partners with investors who want to build their, their portfolio but are too busy to mess with tenants, toilets, and termites by curating opportunities in his Hui Deal Pipeline Club where his investors have personal access to him and know that Lane is personally putting his money on to the line as well. So Lane, really excited to have you. Currently, it looks like you've acquired over about a half a billion dollars of real estate uh, through syndications, and which equi equates to roughly about around $60 million in uh, private equity since 2016. So hey, but always great to have you on. I'm excited to get into this conversation. How have you been? Um, good, good. A little, we, we kept on going on that trajectory. We're over a billion dollars of assets now, um, 7,500 units, but, uh, yeah, you know, keep rinse, wash and repeat. It gets easier after a while. I mean, uh, bigger deals, you get at the top of the broker list. Um, it, it's part of the beginning, right? When you're trudging around with all these like crappy class C buildings and difficult tenants, like those, those are the hard ones for sure. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. So right now you're it sounds like you're roughly around a billion dollars. Uh, so in terms of unit count, what does that what does that equate to? About seventy five hundred okay. units. Yeah. Okay. So so talk a little bit about that. I think that's a really good conversation piece, right? Because you talk about C class assets and then B, and then now it sounds like you're focused predominantly on on A product, maybe B product as well. So how Talk a little bit about the progression and where you're focusing on right now and why. Yeah, I mean, Class C properties, we started with this when we started because that's all the crap that we have access to. They, on paper, have better returns, but, you know, it's kind of very similar to you look at little rental properties that are $60,000, $70,000, that right, for eight hundred, eight fifty. dollars It just never happens like that because your, your grade of tenants are way worse with that, but Hey, you know, beggars can't be choosy. And when you're, you don't have access to that much capital and you're newbies, um, you know, the brokers don't give you much respect. So that's what you just have to start off with. So, you know, the idea is there, we tried to sell them off as soon as possible, as soon as we got through most of the business plan. Um, but yeah, we kind of focus more on class B assets because I mean, and I think everybody kind of agrees that's kind of the sweet spot in this all this world. Um, we still try and stay away from the A's predominantly. I mean, it's, for, you know, in this pandemic, the A's actually did better overall. But, you know, in the traditional recession where everybody's impacted very similarly, you know, the high end, the middle end, the low end, um, you know, normally in a, in a recession, the A's move to the B class, the B's move to the C's. So the B's is kind of where you want to be to catch those falling folks you know, who lost their W jobs. And then um, in the, the A class are usually the ones that kind of get hit the hardest. But um, still... Class B, you know, so bread and butter, stabilized assets, a little bit of value add, and then starting to get into developments too these days. Uh, so what kind of developments are you getting into? What are you focused on with development? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the idea is like, you know, the thing about multifamily is anybody can do it. The bad thing is everybody can do it. So, you know, anybody can go buy a Class B, C multifamily. And we kind of see, you know, there's a lot of competition out there buying these assets and eventually they're going to go buy 200, 300 unit class B apartments. And, you know, we've gone full cycle on a couple of these, uh, these deals and, or more of these development deals. 
where we build it for like about 150, 180 a unit, and we can sell it for like 240, 250 plus. Um, and we start to look at the numbers that like there's a lot more meat on the bone. And after all, you're creating a lot more value add than taking an existing property and doing a little bit, you know, maybe four to five thousand dollars per unit. Here you're building something from scratch and there's a lot more margin and room for error. That is after you get through the construction process, et cetera. And it, it requires a little bit more experience, right? I mean, that, that was kind of my background working was more horizontal construction, but whether it's horizontal construction or vertical construction, at the end of the day, you know, you're able to pay architects, engineers, construction management to kind of implement the plan and build plans and specs, and you go find a contractor. So in, in actuality, it gets easier the larger your scope of your project goes because you can hire these types of professionals to do this for you. So, you know what, you bring up a really good point, right? So, so talk, first of all, can you talk about the difference between horizontal and vertical construction? Maybe that, that's a good starting point, just to clarify for our audience. And then, you know, you talk about um, there being more margin inside of construction, ground up construction, because essentially you're taking on more risk, right? You're taking on more risk. So usually there's a little bit more upside so long as you're, you're you know, you're buying right. So can you um, talk about the difference between vertical horizontal construction, and then, you know, we'll talk about the value that's created inside of the ground up development space, which is ultimately creating that greater margin, which gives you more, in theory, more room, more margin of error, but definitely more margin on the resale side. All right. So horizontal construction is kind of seen a lot of earthwork, dirt work. Um, I, I got my start working as an engineer at, at, for the railroad. We built a lot, lot of long linear projects, as you would imagine, um, more bridge construction, more excavation, more filling and in, infills um, of dirt. Um, not super technical buildings, right? That's more vertical construction. We're talking about out of the dirt. Some would argue project management, and that's all what a developer is. You're a project manager, unless you're smart enough to hire it out. You can hire all that stuff out once it could be a different scale. Uh, but some will say, I mean, I'll, I came from the horizontal world, so I'll say horizontal construction is harder because you have a lot of more things outside your control, a lot more unforeseen conditions, literally the dirt or like weather delays, whereas in vertical construction, once you've literally nothing there to get in your way. So you know, in the world of vertical construction, you might have projects where you take an office building and turn it into residential or a office building into self-storage. Those are often the hardest, most hairiest projects because they're tying into existing structures. But when you're building something from scratch or a greenfield, right, it's an empty canvas. There's really, it's those unforeseen conditions where you have to eventually fight back and forth with your contractor. And then hopefully your engineer, your plans and specs helps you back up your claim. Those are the things that get you through the construction process. But if you build a professional team around you, that takes care of a lot of these things and you tie the comp plan to it, that usually can get out of the process. The, the thing is like, unless you've been in the engineering field or in the construction industry, it's very hard for somebody, even with good project management skills to carry out, right? Like I think a lot of people who get into real estate investing, you might have a guy who did IT project management, right? The most construction they've ever done in their life is maybe um, put some telecom line two miles under a road, right? Still kind of in the construction world, but at the end of the day, it's all just project management, whether you're building a computer game or, or whatnot. It's just hiring the, the, the managers, the professionals to carry out the tasks for you and being able to kind of vet those people and keep them accountable and manage to the project timelines and schedules. And that's what real estate is on a certain level when you're buying over existing properties. But when you get into the construction, the development stage, you really have to have some background in type, some types of construction or be able to hire those type of people out. Uh, for a lot of people, they don't realize, but you, know, you hire an engineer that makes a buck 20, a buck 50 uh, a year, and you give them maybe 10, 20% upside on top of that. That's more than adequate to run a lot of these types of projects, right? Um, and that's the crazy thing. A lot of these very high, highly um, qualified engineers um, but quite frankly, we're like 10 times the better engineer that I were. You know, they're very, very good at what they do, 
but they're kind of underpaid. The, the missing component is pulling the deal together, getting the equity, getting the bank financing, getting the land, the deal finding. Um, if you can mix with all those other things, you know, your, your potential upside is limitless. Um, but, you know, that's, that's where you can kind of go into a deal, you know, build it for 120, get the loan, uh, the construction loan, and go sell it for double what you built it for. And you, ins- you create that value a lot quicker. Instead of a deal taking maybe three to five years, you're building the thing in a year or two. Um, assuming, you know, knock on wood that you have permits, right? And that's, again, where you hire that a lot of that stuff out. Yeah, so let, let's talk about that a little bit because I, I think you bring up some great points, right, about having, you know, really understanding the construction process because one of the things that I think one of the big differentiators between someone that's doing a traditional rehab and they can have a lot of years experience rehabbing property versus someone who has experience doing ground up construction is understanding the trades really well, right. And the sequence of construction, because it makes a really, really big difference. Um, uh, I, I would argue totally against that, right? Like with the smaller properties, if you're really having a little house, yeah, you have to know all the trades. I don't know Jack about the trades. I don't care. I'm a professional. I hire professionals who know how to do this for me. And when I'm doing like a total high rise, if I were to do thing one, I'd be hiring the professionals who've done it in the past. So from my perspective, I'm a project manager. I don't need to know Jack about this thing, right? Like if somebody was a project manager who, creating some kind of business software, they're not a computer programmer. They don't know Jack about the trade, but they just need to know enough to build their contract to be able to get the deliverable. Right. And this kind of gets into the realm of like, at some point, you're not going to know anything about actually what's going on in the black box, but you need to know what hire for the black box. And you can't do this unless you have a large enough project scope. Right. Um, and I think that's unfortunately, like there's a lot of people, it doesn't transfer over. Like you might have a lot of good knowledge of the trades, the, I mean, I'm here, I don't even know what they are, right? Like you got the plumbers, you got the drywall. I mean, I guess I kind of know, right? Like I know I know all the working parts and it's not rocket science, right? But when you start to layer on top of layers of like, you know, all these plans and specs, I mean, I would be the engineer. I have a PE stamp, but I don't know all this stuff. And I know, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not going to take on the liability and be the person stamping and signing drawings. I'm smart right, enough so I'm to not, know. So I'm not referring to you. I'm not saying that you need to know it. Professionals with the years of yeah. experience and track record who've yeah. done this type of stuff. Yeah. So I'm not saying. Yeah. That you, it actually I'm gets easier. Saying that, you I'm know? not saying that you need to know it or that I need to know it. What I am saying is that the people that we hire, you know, to put those projects together need to understand the sequence of construction of the trades, right? Otherwise, right. To, your right. Point, to your point, now you're kind of back at square one and you're being sucked into the process. Now, I think, it, I think it's helpful when you have an understanding of what that process looks like. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you can hire all that stuff out. But my point is that, you know, whoever you're hiring should understand the sequence of construction and also the trades well enough to be able to put these type of projects together. And you're right. The bigger the scope, right, the, I think uh, the project affords you to hire more sophisticated people, more professional people, and folks that, uh, frankly, you can pay more. Um, to be able to leverage your time, right? Because they're, they're, you know, they're being paid to, you know, they're being paid for those, for those details. And so the larger the project, I get it, right? The, the, I don't want to say the better quality people, but you get to, you have a higher budget for salaries, I think, to be able to attract uh, people with, with, with uh, stronger skill sets. Yeah. And, and after a while, you're not hiring people for their expertise, expertise entirely, but you're also hiring them for their liability. Right? Like, I mean, there were times when I had to like, because we didn't have budget, I had to build a culvert or design it. I don't know how to do it, but I, you know, I can go on YouTube. And, know, it's not on YouTube, but I can go on and get the drawings and get the, get the different formulas to do it. But we hire a professional to do it so you can stamp and sign that thing and take the liability on, o- over it. And then when we get to construction, when an unforeseen condition comes up, we can fight tooth and nail with the contractor to say, no, this is what the plans and specs says, says the engineer, and the engineer defends that claim for us. And that's essentially all that you know construction is. 
the contractor is going to sign up for a job, but ultimately when you get into it, you're going to have to fight with that contractor. And there's a lot of negotiation and gamesmanship into fighting these unforeseen conditions claims. And, um, you know, I think that's where you, you hire the construction management firm to kind of help you to defend that. And that's where a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can tie that comp plan to it, you know, whether it's, you know, certain days before schedule or total budget, you know, they take a certain cut of the, the delta. Um, there's different ways you can kind of protect yourself as an owner. But um, definitely, sits, you know, I think people see these big high rises. And I thought at one time, too, that they're a lot more difficult. And you know, it's like, I can't do that. But if you can get to that larger scale, right, if you can start to do 50, $100 million projects, you can pull together 10, $20 million dollars. And especially bring in a pref equity investor alongside an institutional investor to help you bring in a good chunk of the equity to get you from that 10, 15, 20 million dollars up to 30 million dollars equity capital raise. Now you're cooking with fire. Now you can get on that bigger scale and hire these professionals to execute that project for you. So but- at what point, you know, at what point did you start recognizing the advantage of that type of scale? When did it when did it all click? Um, I mean, I, I kind of just got into it and we started to go on with contractor or brought on the architect. And then I was like, Oh my God, I'm in the same thing I used to do at my workplace. Right. And, but luckily it was like so much easier because when I used to work for the government or even with, um, uh, private companies, you have to go through all this like BS, like selection process. You have to put out a <laughs> RFP and you have to like write le- stupid letters so that you don't get sued because of some disqualification claim, you know, like, um, <laughs> you know, especially with the government too, you guys, everything has to be fair and documented, you know, uh, um, that's uh, funny, yeah. here's a little trick for everybody. If, ev- if, if, if everybody, eh, I don't care anymore, I'm not going to go work any for anybody anymore, but like, you know, if you have like the government has really funky, like type of like uh, sourcing contracts and, and things you're supposed to do, right? So you award it fairly, but you as the engineer, you're aligned, you want what's best for the owner, which is the government in this case, and you want the best product at the best price. That's not, you're not always aligned with the sourcing guidelines and things that were, are there because people have stolen money and doing some nefarious things in the past. So you have to balance both. Like, one thing I would do is like, you know, if there was a contractor that put in a good bid that I've worked with in the past and they're by far the easy choice, but here comes this other one that like isn't as good or there's this other one that is kind of in the middle. What I would do is I would just throw out the one in the middle and just put the two together and compare it. So now it's easy looks on paper that I made the right, best decision and I did make the best decision, but I have to justify with all this nonsense this government bureaucracy that just slows down the process, costs all this internal government money. And this is just government waste. And this drove me crazy. But it's kind of like the, the bachelor, right? Like the last two, right? <laughs> if you're smart, if you're, if you're in a bachelor, right? And you're trying to select between, you know, maybe you're a bachelor, right? You're trying to select between the two guys. And you know, you don't want it to be super hard, right? Especially the last round. So you, you select the one that you want. And then it's like the way you don't, right? So then you're kind of, I mean, just fun at the end. You're not really like in a heart tease or anything like that. But that's, uh, <laughs> those, are, those are some pro hacks right there. You know, <laughs> Listening to you talk through that, it's, uh, you know, it's just painful, right? It makes me be so thankful that, you know, I'm not in corporate America anymore. I know. Uh, I mean, just like, yeah, we're going to use them. Cool. And if you screw us, we'll never work with you again. Simple. Well, I mean, there, you know, you, you always have some type of qualification process until you get to the point where you, you know, you know how people work and you have some experience with them and, and um, you know, you have a little bit of history, right? But the point there being is it's nothing like the bureaucratic process of a government agency. I mean, that, that's just cool. mind numbing or even a, you know, a Fortune 50 company for that matter. Like I used to work. Yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are like REITs, there are projects like going up at the same time as us, right next adjacent to us that's done by a REIT. And it's just moving like a turtle over there. I think one of the reasons why is they'll, they use other, they don't raise all the capital up front, right? They kind of self fund to get the project going, but then they have to wait for other business units in their business to cut off cash flow. It's a cash flow issue. So I think that's part of the problem too, but they just move like a bunch of turtles over there. 
know, but it's probably still faster than the government, I bet. <laughs> So let's let's talk a little bit about. I know this this topic, you know, um, is probably going to be more appealing to senior operators or, or operators that have been doing or in this business for quite some time. So maybe shed a little bit of light on, um, you know, what have you learned over the past two years, right? So we just kind of went through this whole COVID cycle. You know, we're, we're we've come out of that, kind of still in it a little bit. But what were some of the big takeaways from that period that you've been able to learn and then carry over into how you're doing business today? Um, I mean, as far as COVID goes, I mean, I think I'm even more confident in the strategy of picking up good workforce housing, B-class housing. It seemed to perform very well during this whole pandemic thing. Uh, you know, normally we're like at 97% collections, I think, the worst of it in April of May 2020, just a couple of years ago now. Um, maybe it went down like a few percent points to 94, 95% across the board. But all in all, I mean, well, well before like the break even point where you start to lose money. And now I'm kind of even more confident, like I said. Uh, some lessons learned off the top of my head. Well, you know, I think if you would have looked at like deals in 2016 compared to now, like back then it was 80, 90% of the deals were done via Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, non-agency uh, debt. That's, you know, you have those big prepayment penalties. Today, it's complete opposite. 80 to 90% of the deals are done by bridge loans because that's the only thing that's out there. A lot of that low-hanging fruit has been taken and it's not around anymore. And therefore, you're going to have to go after slightly hairier deals, still still stabilize, but you're going to need to go into these deals without that prepayment penalty because you have a little bit more of a value add twist to it. So I think a lot of people, you know, they, I think the projected returns of most deals have kind of stayed the same, but the profile has changed. So yeah, I think overall, you can kind of say that the overall returns have gone down because those deals are gone. Right. You're having a little bit more hairier deals, um, which isn't always a bad thing that you're going to have to go in for kind of the same amount of return. So that kind of has been one lesson learned there because, you know, some of the deals, you know, they, they completed or got into a certain cycle. And then it's like that, pre, that damn prepayment penalty. What a pain, that thing. Yeah, I can, that, can, that can cut into your margin pretty, pretty nicely. So, so Lane, you, you bring up a really good point, right? Um, you said, I think the way that you phrased it was you're, you're still, you're still, the deal profile has changed. So can you, can you elaborate on that a little bit? When you say the deal profile has changed, so you're looking at kind of the same deals, but the profile of that deal has changed. So are you saying that, you know, you're still looking for the same type of product, right? B product. But the profile has changed in that, you know, you're taking on a little bit more risk than you historically have for, you know, maybe there's, you said there's a little bit more hair on the deal. So are you taking on traditionally now a little bit more risk, right, than you would have in the past because the markets have shifted a little bit or just, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, very slightly, right? I think. You know, I'll be very clear here because sometimes podcast listeners are not the smartest out there and they, they, they hear that word. And they're like, oh, my God, everyone's being super risky out there. It's like, well, it's like, you know, if deals that we're going into are like 95 percent occupied, now we got to go into like 93 percent occupied. Or, you know, property. It's like chill out, guys. It's the same thing for the most part. But, you know, like deals, you would find that they would cash flow at like eight, nine percent a year from LP's perspective, now the cash flow might be like sub 5%, a lot less in a way, but you know, at the end of the day, it's not too much of a difference, especially for our credit investors in a lot of deals. They don't care about four or 5% different in cash flow per year, right? They're, they're in it for the total return. So maybe in the beginning, you might've seen deals where, say you were gonna double your money in five years, just to throw that out that year. Um, maybe, prior to like half of that was coming through cash flow throughout the cold because you know eight ten per percent times five years is half of it and then the other half you were getting through the value add which wasn't right. it was less right. of a better play now it's more like maybe a third of the money is coming through cash flow two-thirds is coming through the, the force appreciation uh, 
seems like an, a lot, but like when you're projecting out three to seven years in the future, it's very minute. So still, but I'm just kind of just highlighting these slight changes that are kind of happening over a time span of three to five years. That's so, so it sounds like on your your end, ex, investor expectations right have have shifted slightly. Maybe not investor expectations, but how you're setting those expectations with investors is probably a better way to put it. Yeah, I mean, most passive investors probably don't even notice a difference, right? It's so minute. And it really is not that big of a difference, but that's, you know, that's the way I see how things have kind of shifted a little bit. And I'm sure it will continue to go that way more. And so do you, do you, are you seeing then, at least in maybe some of your deals or some of the deals that you're looking at, that the, the LP returns, or really in this case, a return on cash, has gone down a little bit to make it make the deals work on the front end, right? So your your cost of capital is going down, right? When you pay not less. Cash. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. it's a function of structure. Then it sounds like, right? So you're having to structure your deals a little bit differently to be able to um, make the deal work on the acquisition by reducing your cost of capital. I'm seeing that all. all I've been seeing that for the last probably the last two years. Where the- and from an LP's perspective, like the unsophisticated ones will be like, well, it's getting too, too low, right? It's like, well, what else are you going to do that's better? You know, because the, the conditions have changed. Inflation is what? Supposedly 7%. Some say it's 15%. It's like, well, the pressure to do nothing is even stronger now, even at like a tenth of a less returns. And, and, you know, so it's pressure like, to do something. The pressure to right. do something, yeah, stronger now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just look at, like, you just Google, like, multifamily cap rates, right? And you just look at that trend line. It's going down, and that just means less returns for you. And, but that's, it is what it is. It's always relative, right? Like, what do you want it to be? Super high? Because that's in a point where the economy is crap and rents aren't going up. Like, are you yeah, still going to not invest so, in that? Like, yeah. it, I mean, we're just talking to the people who always never do anything, right? They're always looking for an excuse not to do anything. The people who are already investing, they they don't really buy into all this minutia. They're always just looking for good, solid deals. That makes sense. So you 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 brought up something that I think is really interesting. Um, so you talk about declining cap rates, right? Market tightening up, uh, inflation also. In this case, I think growing a little bit more. It has been for the last two years, rather. But I think that's one of the reasons why you see the shift into development projects, because when we when we make investments, we're taking on more risk, right? For that that greater margin, and so um, I mean I'm seeing that you know we're doing the same thing. We started that shift about two years ago, uh, maybe about two and a half years ago. But I like it because in some cases, right, these projects will, will take two years, a year to go through the planning process, a year to build out, and another six months to lease up the project, but you get rewarded very well for taking on all that risk and for that added time relative to what else is out there, even with, with class B product. So are, are, have you, is that, has that influenced your decision um, to get into development, especially with your investor base? Um, Well, I mean, we, we're just, it's not the bread and butter, right? Like the bread and butter, I'll use this analogy, right? Like I, I, I tell my folks like, okay, there's different flavors of ice cream. Before we would just do the vanilla stuff. <laughs> I love your right? analogy. Soft, soft serve, right? Like you got your vanilla ice cream and it's like stabilized. You're doing a little value add. It takes a while though, right? But you getting some pretty damn good returns, I think. It's ice cream. It's backed by real estate, right? In case of the recession, it's cash flowing. <laughs> um, now we're kind of looking at some of these swirl deals where instead of 95% occupied, it might be 90 or we know we're not going to cash flow for a couple of years. That's but we'll be out. Yeah. We'll be out a little quicker, maybe a year or two um, with the same or higher returns. Um, or we might go into chocolate deals, right? Like, these are the, the developments, right? You're not going to cash flow for two years. No, there's no pref because there's nothing there. Why would you put a pref on a development deal? That's silly, I think, unless you have to sell the deal because you don't have investors. So you need to sell it to institutional players and put a pref on there. But, you know, like that's, it, it's not like you have to decide, do I do vanilla? Do I do swirl? Do I do chocolate? 
you have to figure out what your own asset allocation is. Like I still think for new investors, load up on the vanilla first, right? That's your base, that's your cash flow. And then once your net worth rises two, three, four, five million dollars plus, then you get more ballsy and go after the swirl and chocolate a little bit more. The swirls and chocolate aren't as plentiful as vanilla too, right? Because an investor, I said, I was writing this out, all this out, and like, you know, doing emojis. I didn't use the poop and out and out emoji for the chocolate. I used the chocolate one, but somebody is like, I would like a chocolate in Texas. <laughs> well, dude, that's not going to happen. Man. That ain't happening. You can't find like an infill lot in Houston, right? This is not going to happen. Like, I know that's what you want, but that's not what is available out there. You have to build your portfolio with what is coming or what's out there plentiful. And you have to diversify over dozens of deals. Um, but, you know, new investors, they're, they're funny, right? I mean, they just got to get in the game and get into a handful and then, then kind of go from there. But, you know, it, you know, we're all there, right? We're all new investors at the time. So what is on the horizon for you? And then we'll start wrapping this up. We're approaching the end of the show. You know, what is, what is on the horizon for, uh, you know, you and your, your group? Um, I think like, so it's basically now, like in the past, we we're kind of just looking for this one little, like our strike zone was just the vanilla, right? Stabilized assets, value, semi, small value add, minimal value add, this is going to pick. You know, very like five to six grand per unit to bump the rents up a couple hundred bucks, right? That was our that was our jam, right? Call it the inside pitch, yank it to left field. But now we're kind of like, there's not as many deals out there, so we can't be as we can't just sit on the inside pitch anymore. We have to kind of go with what comes. And if it's a if it's like more of like a little hairier deal, eighty five percent occupied in a good area, we'll, we'll go we'll go with it. We'll take that pitch out to the right field, outside the right corner. Um, if it's a development deal and the development, what, what, what triggers that is buying the, the land at a good um, amount. Um, now, anything higher than a hundred thousand you know, acres is just going to be too, too much. Um, there, there's a certain threshold where it kind of actually makes sense. It's not just gouging it. Even if you're in a prime location that, but like, that's very rare, right? That's why I said, like finding chocolate deals in Texas or whatever, it ain't going to happen. Um, so you can dream all you want. It can happen. And in the meantime, you, passive investors, you have to deploy your capital. I've had investors be like, you know, they've come to Hawaii and they say, well, I'm not to financial freedom yet. You know, I'm in 12 deals. I'm like, well, dude, you're investing the minimum, every single one of these things, and you only need to play, deploy like half a million dollars. But like, you know, this isn't magic, right? <laughs> you're and this is that's why it's good because it is not a get rich quick thing. It's not like an asymmetric risk type of thing. There's only a certain amount like upside that you get in these types of deals, but that's why you do it because it's backed by a hard asset. It's all ice cream, right? At the end of the day, you know, the, the times go bad, it still holds on to its value. But it's you have to deploy capital. So it's like what we do with a lot of people is we look through their portfolio, like home equity, um, IRAs. Typically, the retirement accounts don't make any sense most for people, especially if they're under three hundred forty thousand dollars AGI married filed jointly, or they have more than, or they have less than half a million, a million dollars in their IRA account. I just say get rid of it. That's kind of my my staff judgment. Every situation is different, but they have to get that stuff in from like the marketable securities, the retail crap and get it into halfway decent stuff. And that's ultimately like, you're trying to get all your money working for you so you don't have to work as hard. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that, man. I like that. Well, hey, but it's always a pleasure to have you on. And I think this has been a great conversation because this one has been more focused on construction. Very rarely do we get into uh, that type of conversation, especially larger projects uh, in a cycle like we just have come out of. And man, I really appreciate you sharing some of the insights that you have. I think the information was great. So I'm going to ask you a question since I've been asking questions for the last 30 minutes. What question do you have for me, Lane, that you think can add some value to your listener base uh, as well as ours? What is the number one most annoying question investors ask you? <laughs> uh, well, yes. Ye yesterday I was on a call with... Uh, and I, I offered this out to a very good client of mine. Not, not the chocolate Texas guy? No, not, no, not the chocolate <laughs> guy. But here's something really interesting, okay? Um, and after I got off the call, I, I, I just I kind of shook my head. 
but I offered this out to a, a client of mine, also a really good friend that's been working me, with me for, gosh, I want to say seven, eight years now. So I offered to be in a call with his CPA. He was doing some financial planning, some estate planning, so that I can talk through some of our holdings. And we had a CFP on the call. And um, I was more shocked about the questions that they were asking me, especially since I already provided them all the information that they were asking for a month in advance. <laughs> and I was, I was just a little bit shocked, man. Um, but what that, what that call taught me was that, you know, oftentimes when you're in a space and, you know, you're hiring people to, to look out for your best interest, you know, they're oftentimes, you know, the advice that's being given to you is driven by what they're getting paid on, right? And to me, it was, it was a little bit- Yeah, obvious. they don't want to lose that client, man. Yeah, it was really yeah. obvious. It was really, really obvious. Um, and, and I think it's, it, it, you know, it's unfortunate, man, you know, the, the, the securities world, and just think about that, right? What a marketing term, security. <laughs> I mean- Marketable security, security keyword marketable. marketable. Security, I mean, that's all marketing, man. That's all marketing. But even when you just think about that space, Right. Um, I think sometimes people in that world, man, especially with these designations behind them, you know, you can live so much in retail sales of that product that you actually forget about planning. And um, I think my. Or you start to believe the BS. You start to believe right? the BS. That's, that's all they know. I mean, that's all yeah, they know. That's all you know. And man, I was just really shocked. I was completely yeah. shocked. You know, I, I think. Um, uh, one of the questions that I get asked uh, a lot, and it was even in this, is people are always, financial advisors always want to know when you intend on selling, right? So a lot of their questions are driven around when you intend on selling. And of course, the motivating factor for that is so that we can figure out how to deploy that money, right? Let me start selling this line on diversifying, yeah. you know, the, this equity or this cash now into... <laughs> Other holdings such as marketable securities. So the, the funny thing but is, that, that, but that's their that's the one knock against this, right? That's why they go after like like real estate is not liquidable, right? It, it's well, it's liquid. not as marketable. So well, and that's why they go after it. Yeah. But but here's what I always ask them, and this is I've been in a lot of these conversations, and I find them really interesting, man. One on one got pretty heated, but I always ask them. I go, you know, um, once this sells, and now you take a million dollars, you have a million dollars liquid cash that client's going to have to pay tax on some of that. What do you intend on deploying that capital into, right? Where do you intend on placing that money? <laughs> and I, I, I've never gotten the same answer, but what I have gotten is the consistency is always around placing that money somewhere where uh, it's a little bit more liquid, right? Which is pointing more to securities, man. Uh, but I, I always ask, I go, okay, well, you know, if, if your objective is to now know when we're going to sell so you can take that money and ultimately reinvest it into another investment, say it's a stock, and now you're generating you know, a 3% return on cash and you're looking to ride 3% return on cash at best, and you're looking to ride up some appreciation, uh, and say you're using your, your typical projected amount of 12%, right, historically, I said, well, if that's the case and we're doing double that now, even if we hold the asset for another 10 years and you start selling the fact that your yield goes down or your return goes down as you, as you hold the asset, right? Longer out into the horizon. I said, well, my question is always, well, why should we sell? If, if your greatest opportunity is less than half of what we're generating now, and ultimately you're trying to understand when it is that we're looking to sell so you can reinvest the money, what is the benefit of selling, right? I mean, I always ask that. What is the benefit of selling if ultimately the objective for you is to reinvest those dollars? And if we're so that the agent can get their load fees. <laughs> well, I know that, but right? that's my, always my question, right? Is, <laughs> well, if, if the best that you're going to do is half of what we're doing now, what's the value of selling? What's the benefit? <laughs> and, yeah. normally, I don't know. You're, you're too nice, John. Normally, those those conversations get really quiet after that, man. 
Yeah, you're too nice. I I don't know. I'm just too impatient these days. I'm like, I'm here to help people, but I'm like, when I get into those types of things, especially with those other professionals, I'm not the client. It's like, all right, well, what's your net worth, bro? Yeah, that's another. All right, sit you down. Sit down. You know, show me a PFS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just here to help the first people, right? Like, I mean, people don't need to listen, but the numbers speak for themselves. I agree with that. I agree with that. And I think that's a really good point, man, is, you know, if you're going to seek advice from someone, be willing to ask for a personal financial statement from them, right? I mean, because if they themselves haven't built, you know, if they themselves haven't built up an amount of net worth that uh, helps justify that they're an expert in that area, probably not a good idea to take advice from them, man. I mean, I think that yeah. that's golden. That's a golden nugget. That's a million dollar nugget. Yeah. I thought you were going to go a different way with that. Like I've had it where like lawyers or like um, CPA start critiquing a deal. And I'm like, wait a minute, like this is not your area of expertise. That's like a civil engineer talking about the electronics in the bridge, you know, like you guys are like, like, and plus you're talking about the structure, the split structure, like it has nothing to do with the deal or the legalities of the deal too. Like, what are you guys critiquing that type of stuff for, right? And I don't know. That's just, that's annoying one too. <laughs> well, hey, bud, it's always a pleasure to have you on, man. And uh, I want to wish you continued success. Uh, and and I'll, now that I know that you're, you know, you're working through some development opportunities, um, when I come across it, I'll reach out. Yeah. All right, man. All right, man. Take care. All right. Later, man. Keep doing it. Man. Take care of yourself. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.